What do you do when, you're, when your world falls apart? I mean, when you get the call and it's the dreaded word, you have cancer. When the boss calls you into the office and said, I'm sorry, we're still having to cut back, you're fired, you're laid off. What do you do in a time like that? What do you do when a loved one walks out the door? What do you do when you break off an engagement that you had your hopes penned on? What do you do when someone dies in your family that was really the pillar in your life? What do you do when an accident happens and all of a sudden all your plans are thrown out the door for the foreseeable future? This is the question that a guy named Jeremiah asked thousands of years ago. Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament times in Israel. And during his lifetime, he saw his nation decimated. Here's what happened in Israel during his time. The nation went into an economic crisis in a tailspin. His land was terrorized by a foreign enemy. They actually came in and began to take people out and move them to another country as slaves. He witnessed incredible inhumanities uh, done to people and all kinds of suffering. Everybody was out of work and people were literally starving to death. Now during this time, Jeremiah wrote two books. One is called the Book of Jeremiah and the other is called the Book of Lamentations. Most people don't know about the Book of Lamentations. It's very short. Now, what is a lamentation? Lamentation is a word we use anymore. It's an old English word that means to complain. So you could call this book the book of complaints because that's really what it is. To lament means to complain. When I unload my sins on God, that's called confessing. When I unload my complaints on God, that's called lamenting. And so the book of Lamentations is literally just a book of Jeremiah's complaints against God. It's not a real positive book. But in the middle of it, there's a very positive message on what to do when your plans fall through, on how to rebuild your life when your world falls apart. We're going to look today at Lamentations chapter 3. If you have a Bible, open to that chapter. If you don't, all of the verses we're going to look at are there on your outline. And we're just going to go verse by verse through chapter 3 and look at six lessons that Jeremiah learned, six steps that he took to rebuild his broken world. Now let me just say this. I hope you don't need this message right now. I hope your world isn't falling apart, but you better take notes because you're going to need this someday. Life is not going to always be smooth for you. You're going to have your life fall apart multiple times in your lifetime, and you need to know what to do when your plans fall through. So you need to write this down. You certainly can share it with a friend this week, whether you're in the crisis right now or not. Now, we'll just start with Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. And the first lesson we learn is this. When my plans fall apart, when my world falls apart, the first thing I need to do is unload all my frustrations on God. That's the first step. I just need to tell God exactly how I feel. This is called a catharsis. You just tell God how you feel, and you can complain to God, and you can... You know, uh, uh, you know, just express all your grief and your anger and your fear. Uh, Jeremiah in this book is incredibly bold with God. He just calls God out. And he says, God, I don't like what's going on in my life. I'm tired of this. Enough's enough. I need a change. Come on, you're treating me poorly. And he complains. He does a Jeremiah. That's what we get from this, this book. And he lets out his anger to God in its full fury. Let me just read a few verses. In uh, Lamentations 3, 1 to 10, he says this. I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He's talking about God. He, God, has driven me away and made me walk in darkness 
rather than in light. He, God, has turned his hand against me again and again and again, all day long. He has made my skin grow and broken my bones, grow old and broken my bones. He surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He's made me dwell in dark places, in darkness like the dead. He says, God has walled me in so I cannot escape. He says, there's no way out. He says, he's weighed me down with chains. Even when I cry out to God for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He's made my paths crooked. Now, that's in the Bible. Does that surprise you? Somebody's calling out God in the Bible? And and really, he's just getting started. He does it for five chapters. (laughs) He is just really complaining to God. And he's saying, God, this stinks. Now, why in the world would God put that kind of passage in the Bible? I'll tell you why. Because what God wants you to know, he can handle your anger. He can handle your frustration. He can handle your gripes and your grief. Actually, this entire book is one long complaint. That's why they call it lamentation. And he, God, is allowing Jeremiah to blow off steam. Now, You've heard me say this many, many times, that if I don't talk out my emotions to God, I will take them out on my body. When I swallow my anger, my stomach keeps score. When I swallow my emotions, my frustration, I take it out on my body. So, oh man, it's a pain in the rear. Well, how do you think it got here? You swallowed it and it went south, okay? Stopped at your neck, some of you, the pain stopped in your neck. Some of it went a little bit lower and it went in your back. But when you swallow your negative emotions, you take it out on your body. God says, it's okay, I can handle this. I can handle, go ahead and just tell me how you're feeling. Give me all your complaints. It's not fair what's going on right now. God, I don't like this in my life. It's okay to tell God that you're ticked off. Let me just show you one other verse. Down in verse 17 and 18, here on the screen, uh, Jeremiah says this. I cannot find peace. I cannot remember happiness. So I've been out of work so long, I can't remember anything. I tell myself, I am finished. And I can't count on the Lord to do anything for me. See how blunt he is? How bold he is? You ever felt that way? Of course you have. God, I've had enough. This is not right. This is unfair. God says, that's okay. It's step one to recovery in your life when your world is falling apart. You need to unload your frustrations to God. You know, now I know this wasn't true of you, but when my kids were little, they used to have temper tantrums. And when I wanted them to do something they didn't want to do, or I wouldn't let them do something they wanted to do, as little immature children, they would have temper tantrums. Now, when my kids had temper tantrums, did that make me feel less than of a father? No. Did it make me want to change my mind? No. Did it cause me to doubt myself and wonder, am I really doing the right thing? No. Did it make me stop loving them? Of course not. I just knew they can't see what I see. They don't know what I know. I am more mature. I know more than they know. And maybe later they'll thank me for this. But it doesn't really matter. It's the right thing to do. And so we're going to do it whether they like it or not. And I was doing it out of love. And their temper tantrum did not bother me. It didn't make me think, oh, I'm a terrible parent. No, I just knew they were immature. God does not owe you an explanation for everything that happens in your life. God is God and you're not. And a lot of things are gonna happen in your life you're never gonna understand until you get to heaven. And when you get to heaven, you're gonna go, oh, well, that's why. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you don't understand now what's happening, but you will later. Most of the things in your life that happen to you, you're not gonna understand why they happened on this planet. And God's not gonna give you an explanation because even if you did, you'd still go, well, I don't like it this way and it wouldn't change anything. And so God can handle your temper tantrums. And he's not gonna love you any less. 
because he can handle your temper tantrums. He is God, and if an imperfect dad can do that, certainly a perfect heavenly father can. Now, once I've let it all out, and I've kind of spiritually vomited, blah. Did you like that? (laughs) Then you go to the second step. And the second step is I must turn my focus from my pain to God's love. I must turn my focus from my pain, my problem, my pressure, my difficulty to God's love. Now, I may be ticked off at God. I may be mad at God. I may be railing and raging against God, but I still need to turn and realize that he still loves me no matter what. And as long as I've got my mind on my pain, it's not gonna solve anything. In verses 19, down to verse 26, um, Jeremiah says this. The thought of my pain, by the way, we've talked about this now for several weeks, it always starts in your mind. We're in this battle called the invisible war, and whether you're battling yourself or you're battling the world around you in circumstances, or you're battling Satan, it always starts in your mind. It's a mental war. The thought of my pain and my homelessness is bitter poison. He goes, I, it makes me really want to spit. It's bitter poison. And then he says, now I think of it constantly, and my spirit is depressed. Well, duh, it's because you're thinking of it constantly. Now, he says here, the thought of my pain and bitter, uh, creates bitter poison. Bitterness is a poison that hurts you. Your bitterness isn't hurting somebody else. The person you're bitter against, the person you're resentful against, the person you've got a grudge against, the person you dislike, they're not even thinking about you. The bitterness is only making you miserable. It is a self-inflicted wound. It is a bitter poison, and that poison will eat you up. He says, so it's a bitter poison when I'm thinking, this is not fair, this is not fair, this is not fair. But he says, I still think of it constantly. Okay, great, you think of it constantly. How's that working for you, Jeremiah? Is that making you happy, making you positive? Is that causing peace in your life? He goes, no, my spirit is depressed. You're not gonna get over your depression until you stop being bitter. You're not gonna get over your depression until you let it go. You're not gonna stop being depressed until you learn to forgive, until you let it go. Bitterness keeps you caught in your own pain and that creates depression. So he says, the longer I think about it, the more depressed I get. Well, simple, change the way you think. Now he says, yet, here's the switch, where he turns his focus from his pain to God's love, yet hope returns. How does hope return? when I've lost everything, when my world's falling apart. How does hope return? Hope returns when I remember this one thing, the Lord's unfailing love and his mercy still continue. They're as fresh as the morning, they're as sure as the sunrise. The Lord is all I have, the Lord is all I have, so in him I put my hope. Now he says, first off, the Lord's unfailing love and mercy, it's still there. Did you know that even when I'm railing against God, he's still loving me? That's amazing. God, I'm telling you how life is terrible right now, but you still love me. And the one thing I can count on is your love is unfailing, and it's as fresh as the morning, and it's as sure as the sunrise. And I say, the Lord is all I need. It's all I have. So I put in him my hope. You don't know God is all you need until God is all you've got. So sometimes God allows you to lose everything and then you realize, man, all I've got is God and then you realize, hmm, that's all I need. If you got God, he's all you need because he's gonna take care of everything else. So I turn my focus from my pain to God's love. If you want to make your time in prayer the best it can be, then you're going to want to get a copy of the Daily Hope Prayer Journal. The theme is growing your prayer life. This vegan leather full color prayer journal has sections to pray for specific people and situations, as well as space to express your gratitude and personal prayer requests to God. 
Each page is beautifully designed and filled with inspiring Bible verses, photos, and artwork. The Growing Your Prayer Life Prayer Journal is a spiritual growth tool designed to help you enjoy a vibrant prayer life. Connect with the Lord, strengthen your prayer practice, and establish a consistent daily prayer time. When you give a financial gift to this ministry, we'll send you the Daily Hope Prayer Journal to say thanks. Quantities are limited, so don't wait. By the way, this month only, any gift you give will be matched up to $100,000. Look at this next verse. Down in verse 31, he says this, chapter three. The Lord is merciful, and he won't reject us forever. He may bring us sorrow, but his love for us is, read it with me, sure and strong. Underline that, circle it. His love for us is sure and strong. Even in the middle of my pain, his love for us is sure and strong. He takes no pleasure in causing us grief or pain. Some people think God is some cosmic killjoy, that he's some meanie up in the sky, some universal dictator who just wants to make your life miserable. And that every time he looks down and he sees you having a little fun, he wants to say, hey, stop that. Stop having fun. And when you're smiling, he says, wipe that smile off your face. That's not God, that's your dad. And a lot of people confuse God with their overbearing father or their overbearing mother. God is not your mother. God is not like your father. God is God. So don't take some imperfect picture of your parent who might have been stringent or strict and think that that's what God is. The Bible says he takes no pleasure. He gets no thrills. He doesn't get his kicks, his, his jollies out of making your life miserable. When you're going through pain, what is God doing? He's grieving with you. When you're going through loss, what is God doing with you? He's grieving with you. He takes no pleasure. It's not not sadistic in any way. So what do I do? I unload all my frustration on God, and then even though I'm mad at him, I remind myself of how much he loves me, and I focus off of my pain and my problem, and I focus on God's love. Now the next thing you need to do, I need to get alone with God and wait. Get alone with God and wait. This is the third step in the rebuilding process after a crisis, a tragedy, or a major loss. Get alone with God and wait. Now waiting, waiting before God, is a spiritual discipline, a spiritual habit, a spiritual skill, and you must learn how to wait before God or you're gonna be stressed out most of your life. I can always tell who knows how to wait on God and who doesn't. People that don't know how to wait on God are anxious all the time. They don't know how to let it go. They're always, always, always anxious. You have to wait on God. It is the number one de-stressor in your life. Now, what does it mean to wait on God? It means you be quiet, you wait. You don't say anything, you don't ask anything, you just be quiet and you listen, and you have to make time with God every day. We call it a quiet time, where you just sit down and be quiet. Now, yes, you're gonna read your Bible a little bit later, and you're gonna pray a little bit later, but I'm talking about literally just being quiet. Most of you have never sat in silence for 10 minutes simply waiting on God. It will revolutionize the level of stress in your life if you'll learn to do this. Lamentations 3, verse 28, Jeremiah says this. I love it in the message. When life is heavy, when life is heavy and and hard to take, go off by yourself. Enter the silence. Bow in prayer. Don't ask questions. Wait. Wait for hope to appear. The reason you feel hopeless is you're not waiting for hope to appear. Now, did you know that God wants to talk to you? He's trying to talk to you all the time. So I never have God talk to me because all your circuits are busy. 
He calls you and you're on another line. You're listening to the iPod, iPad, radio, TV. You're talking to somebody else. Your life is very seldom quiet. And God can't get through. All the circuits are busy. In order to focus on God and to get alone with God and wait, you're gonna have to eliminate some distractions in your life. Notice it says there, enter the silence. Circle that. Enter the silence. What does that mean? Get in a receptive mood. It means to say, God, I want to hear you. I'm eager, I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm able, I'm teachable, and you enter the silence. Jesus taught the very same thing Jeremiah is recommending here in this chapter. Jesus taught it in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what he said, Matthew chapter six. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. In other words, go off in secret. Role play before God. He says, you know, don't, don't, be trying to pray, pray the prayers where you're trying to impress everybody else. Just get off by yourself and be there as simply and as honest as you can. Just whatever you can manage, just get as authentic as you can manage. And the focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense God's grace. That ain't gonna happen unless you're quiet. You got to be quiet. Now, I want to challenge you to make a commitment for the next seven days that you'll say, God, for the next seven days, I'm going to spend 10 minutes in silence with you every day. And you can read your Bible after that. You can pray after that. I'm talking about just sitting in silence for 10 minutes and you just say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? And you be quiet. You wait on God. You will be amazed at the strength that you will gain from this. After you have been quiet, if you want to read the book of Psalms, that's a good place to start. If you'd like some devotional material, I write a daily devotional called The Daily Hope. It goes out to about 600,000 people every day. And if you'd like to get it, it's free. It's a daily devotional that'll encourage you a little scripture and, and thought about that. But notice it says the focus shifts and you actually start slowing down. Have you noticed that life always goes into slow motion when you're in a waiting room? Have you noticed how time slows down when you're in a waiting room? It doesn't go fast. You're waiting on doctor. Has it only been five minutes? When you're waiting, time slows down. You know how to make it go slower? Go to a hospital waiting room and wait there, and it really slows down. You don't know how to make it even slower than that? Go to a funeral home waiting room. You know what? That's a good thing. That is a, a good thing to slow down because your life runs at such high RPMs all the time. Brrr, you don't ever slow down. You don't ever be quiet. So the focus can't shift. Now notice what Jeremiah says in the next verse, verse 25. The Lord is good to everyone who trusts in him. So it is best for us to wait in patience, to wait for him to save us. You need to just sit down and wait and wait on God to save you. We've all seen these war movies, military battles, where uh, the good guys are outnumbered 10 to one by the enemy, and the enemy is marching up with their guns or their bows and arrows, and they're coming up to, f to face a much inferior crowd. You don't have as many bullets and you don't have as many arrows. And the wise general or the leader says, you guys, you don't fire until I tell you. Braveheart does this, a lot of guys. Don't, you don't fire until I say. That famous William Preston said it at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He said, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. In other words, we're not gonna waste bullets that are gonna miss. And so the enemy is marching and the enemy is getting closer and closer and closer and you're outnumbering you 10 to one and closer and closer and your leader is saying, wait, 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 don't shoot, wait. And you're going, they're getting awful close, boss. The enemy's coming in, and you're aiming at them, and they're 10 more than you, for every one of you. And the boss is saying, wait, 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 
And finally, Braveheart says, now. Or Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai says, now. Or in a dozen other movies you've seen, now. And then, and the right timing, victory is assured. You will lose the battle if you do it on your time. The only way you're gonna win this battle in life is do it on God's time. God's timing is perfect, and he's telling you to wait. Hello, friends. Did you know that you helped to lead more than 28,000 people to Christ through Daily Hope? That's how many people have written to let us know they've given their lives to Christ as a result of the Daily Hope Bible teaching. You are making a significant difference all around the world. You know, some generous friends are offering a $100,000 matching grant. Now, what that means is that for every dollar you give up to the amount of that grant, $100,000, will be matched. Friends, your financial support enables Daily Hope to continue reaching people, not just here in the U.S., but all around the world. There is nothing more important that we can do together than make sure that everybody, everywhere, hears about Jesus and learns God's Word. God bless you. When you give a gift today, your gift will be doubled by the matching grant up to $100,000 and we'll send you the Daily Hope Prayer Journal to say thanks. 